Welcome to OPLUS TV. Today we have an expert scholar in alternative investments, Dr. Vinay Nair. Dr. Nair, thank you for joining us today. Dr. Nair is frequently invited to speak on the topics of sustainability and investing in emerging markets at various universities, panels, and events. He started his own investment company in 2008 called Ada Investments with a focus on public equities in traditional and alternative investments. Prior to starting his own company, he was a full-time member of the finance faculty at the Wharton School and was also research director and portfolio manager at Old Lane Partners. Currently, he's involved in academia part-time as an adjunct professor at Columbia University in finance and economics and as a visiting professor at the Indian School of Business. Could you please introduce yourself and your background before you started your investment company, please? Came here, came to U.S., came to New York University to do my Ph.D. in finance, to doing engineering, very related fields, and did my Ph.D., did well, got a few offers, finally decided to start teaching at the Wharton School where I taught private equity. Started teaching quite young, so I've been teaching now for about nine years, from being a full-time academic to now a part-time academic, or as my friends say, a recovering academic. Taught at Wharton for four years, and during that time, a lot of my research naturally lent itself to consulting opportunities and to presenting my work in some of the larger funds which I did and learned a lot on both the practical side as well as the academic side of things. A lot of my research actually was between these two worlds of asset pricing and corporate finance, and which was really the reason that it was interesting to many funds outside. So I would say in terms of academia, I've been groomed in this world of mainstream finance and economics while trying to bridge two different fields within this mainstream world. From your vantage point in academia, consulting, and presenting to the alternative investment management world, what lessons did you take away? A lot of the work that I was doing and a lot of my colleagues were doing in different schools I was of interest to hedge funds, investment management companies, because a lot of the ideas that the world was playing was came from the sell side and it was getting crowded. A lot of the ideas that came from academia came in the early 90s mostly, which was also getting crowded. And there was this new generation of uh, finance researchers that were coming out with work in behavioral finance and corporate finance and linking all these things into asset prices. So, for example, I had come up with a paper that predicted who the takeover targets are likely to be, which got attention, and I went and presented it in a few different hedge funds. Obviously, if that model works well, you can create a portfolio and capture the potential takeover targets and, and generate returns from it. Now, to capture this potential takeover targets, historically, you wouldn't even look at information beyond your standard, typical balance sheet information. And it turned out that one big aspect that was important in capturing this was to look at shareholder charters, to look at whether there were staggered boards, whether there were poison pills, whether there was a large block holder, and among a lot of other things. But this, that was an example of how getting financial, extra financial data all together helped you predict an event that is clearly of interest to investors. From my studying in academia, as well as from my practical experience in on the street, there were there were several limitations I saw in all the different models that I was looking into, which was predominantly quant and the multi trader strat multi trader multi strategy platform. My experience at Old Lane, which was a great experience in terms of learning things, made me realize that the biggest challenge that they have is actually to to retain the good guys, the good traders, fire the bad traders, and make sure that during the year all the traders are trading consistently. And that was a challenging problem. And that limitation was enhanced by, I would say, an additional limitation to make sure psychologically all the traders wake up every morning and show up in a state of mind where they don't blow up the firm. Whereas on the other side, a lot of the consulting that I did with the quant firms where I was presenting my work, and the reason I was presenting my work there is, is a highlights the limitation is that many of them were too 
black boxy. They had they had great risk management. They had several positions. They had a very diversified approach, but but the ideas were difficult to interpret. Whereas my work was very simple economics, and they were, they were, it was easier to interpret. And in cases when the idea was easy to interpret, and this is when I realized that the existing quant structure is not just about the ideas, it's also about the portfolio process. So even when the ideas were simple to interpret, by the time it became a portfolio, it went through a lot of optimization and algorithms that made the portfolio a bit more opaque than it could have been. After moving full-time to investing, you published a book called Investing for Change. Talk about your book and the philosophies behind your book. The book was written largely because me and my co-author, Augustin Lantier, who is now a professor at Toulouse in France, came across many financial advisors who were intensely confused about this idea of social variables and investing. Now, we decided to study it. A lot of my research early on was in corporate governance and how it affected equity prices. So it was quite natural for me to think about other aspects of corporate governance, such as the extra financial aspects. And we studied it and in the process had, had a book. Now, I view the topic quite differently from the proponents of social responsible investing. For many of these many of these folks, it's about removing tobacco and alcohol, gambling, weapons, etc. I also view it very differently from the typical large investment bank angle to social and sustainability, which I think is purely marketing. I think where I see the opportunities in the center between these two extremes, and the center is effectively that to value a firm to come up with the right evaluation of the potential of the firm, you need to take a holistic view. You need to look at both the financial variables as well as the extra financial variables. And in that extra financial component, there are all kinds of things that fall in, which might do with how the firm treats its employees, how it treats its customers, what kind of environmental liabilities it's creating for itself, what safety standards it's being lax on, and uh, I think all investors would agree that knowing that Massey would have a big accident or BP would blow up before it actually happened is valuable information. And that's what I really mean by extra financial information. Now, the change part in investing in change is that I think that as, as investors and as the world takes into account more and more extra financial information, it will force companies to automatically adhere to higher standards of doing business. So, put differently, if old school social responsible investing was about which business to be in, tobacco, alcohol, etc., we have moved away from that. What we care about is, it doesn't matter what business you're in, make sure the business practices are high quality so that the shareholder value is the highest. Talk about some specific examples from your research and in writing your book where you found extra financial indicators to be a source of alpha. So very, very early on in my research career, actually part of my thesis, was I looked into how corporate governance affects equity prices and bond prices and general asset prices and found that an investor who held a portfolio of, let's say, good governance companies and shorted bad governance companies, of course, to find in a particular manner, generated abnormal returns of 9% per year over the next 13, 14 years. And those returns went away after Enron and WorldCom happened. So what was fascinating to me was here's was a piece of information which in 1990 most people would have thought is not financial information, is not important in picking stocks. And the ones who did pick it generated good returns because of that strategy. And it took 13 years for the market to price that in. And I believe that the same phenomenon is happening with other extra financial variables where customer-related, employee-related, environment-related variables are slowly getting priced in. Now, for this, 
there are two factors. One, I believe these are important variables. And the second thing is that we are surfing a trend. We are leaders. Now, of course, a leader without followers is just, just a man taking a walk. And what we really want to do is make sure there are enough people behind us as well. So the United Nations the Principles of Responsible Investing is, is really a group which has collected about $18 trillion in signatories that is interested in extra financial variables. And I believe a lot of that will be deployed in the future. So if we are early on, we can benefit from that higher multiples associated with sustainable companies. I also think that in typical DCF models in academia, when we did valuation exercises, and I was teaching my students valuation exercises, it was very difficult to come up with a cap T, a horizon to do these valuations. And everyone had a cash flow. They projected it out for five years or three years or seven years or 10 years, discounted it, came up with the value of the firm or put a multiple on the cash flows. I think sustainability actually affects the longevity of the firm and hence affects valuation. That's what I found when I was writing the book. So in other words, we could come up with better measures of what the terminal value is by using extra financial factors. And because of both these angles, I'm convinced that taking into account these extra financial variables and picking more sustainable firms improves your returns, not to mention reduces risks too. Talk about what made you move into investing full-time. The limitations we spoke about, Greg, I think that was the main reason I actually moved because I felt that we could come up with a solution, that I had systems which could actually solve those limitations. And in there was an opportunity, an opportunity which I felt was large and would have impact in the investing world. And very soon, I realized that you can't do this part-time when initially I was trading part-time and we lost some money. And I realized that, that to do this properly and the scope of the, the challenge required us to do this full-time, completely committed. And so I moved full-time. I left my teaching at Wharton and left my tenure track position to start trading. Although it was a passion of mine to be in academia, it was something which was a bigger passion of mine, which was to invest and solve this problem. Dr. Nair, why did you start your own firm? And tell us about Ada's investment philosophy. We started Ada because it was a great time to start, October 2008. And um, the opportunity, I felt, was, was unique in the sense that Everything that we had learned before that, and I had spent about eight years in various phases of academia and practice, and everything that we saw in limitations and then built models to fix it was finally ripe. That we started ADA to address some of those limitations. And you'll see a lot of these thoughts that we've spoken about before actually distill down into ADA's investment philosophy. What we do here really is we have built a systematic version of multi-trader firm. Think of large hedge funds, or think of uh, large multi-strategy hedge funds, or think of a prop desk. So instead of these people having, let's say, 30, 40 traders, each of whom is running a book that some star portfolio manager is aggregating to create the product, what we do is we have 40 rule-based systems that mimic the trader. So we create 40 different sub-portfolios, each of which captures an insight, and then we aggregate these 40 to create a final product. So it's a systematic equivalent of PropDesk that addresses a lot of the incentive issues that I saw early on, and that also addresses a lot of the black box issues that I saw in the quant world, because each of these different insights were simple, economic insights that didn't go through complicated processes before it became a portfolio. Talk more about the selection process for your traders and how you actually pick traders. The other aspect of our investment philosophy is that we want to keep our correlations very low to the rest of the world. Simply put, we want to be different. And again, given something that I'd observed on how crowded 
the space had become in the quant world, as well as in the non-quant world, we felt that we want to take a contrarian approach. So across all our systems, all our 40 different trader equivalents, what we do is we ask the same question. We try to identify what is crowded out there. Sometimes the source of the crowdedness could be could be fundamental, such as all analysts obsessing about the same thing. Sometimes the source of the crowdedness could be behavioral, investors panicking, reacting the same way to information. Sometimes the source could be institutional, such as large firms being forced to use particular risk systems or particular methods and identifying that what inefficiency this crowded behavior is creating in markets and then exploiting that inefficiency. Now, of course, we don't want to stand against against the crowd and get stampeded. So what we're really interested in is to detect the ripples that the elephant is creating while it's walking through, not to stand in front of it. And if you're able to do that successfully, we felt that we could create an uncorrelated process across 40 different ideas and then combine them together. And over the last uh, two and a half years, the results suggest that we've been able to do that. How does sustainability fit into ADA's investment philosophy? As I mentioned earlier, we view sustainability as extra financial information. And many of these investment insights that, that become our sub-portfolios take into account both financial and extra financial insights. Now, tying it back to a broader approach of identifying what is crowded and what is not, here is an aspect of the information that exists in the world that is not crowded today, and I believe will get crowded tomorrow. So that fits into a broader approach of looking for crowded, playing against it, looking for not crowded and playing on it. Talk about emerging markets and Ada's philosophy on emerging markets. So first, when I say emerging markets, it's India for me right now, because that's the only place where we think right now we know how to make money. And that's why we started in India first. A lot of the opportunity in India was what I felt comes from knowledge transfer. So a lot of businesses obviously that, that have been built and will will get built over the next 20, 30 years where you take knowledge from the West and deploy it in emerging markets. And the high growth is there, the knowledge is here in many aspects. And quantitative systematic space had that configuration where a lot of what we had learned in the systematic world resides here in the US and developed markets. And the emerging markets such as India is an opportunity to deploy this knowledge, benefit from higher growth, higher returns. It was a bit like taking a gun to a knife fight in India. We had this world-class research, ideas, frontier, cutting-edge insights, which were deployed in US and working in US. And now you're taking it in India right away. The systematic shops in India clearly had no access to this kind of research ecosystem. And the world-class quant funds here didn't have the local data platforms that we were able to create from scratch. So we felt by combining these two things, we really had an opportunity to deploy our same 40 traders in the Indian environment to generate returns. Now, of course, not all 40 traders work well there. So a subset of those 40 is really what the eventual product became. Please elaborate on the evolution of quantitative strategies and give us some perspective as to why Ada's investment philosophy is evolutionary. What we are doing here, I think, falls into a broader group of initiatives outside currently that I call next generation quant or systematic efforts. And we've seen some interesting quant businesses get formed over the last 20, 30 years that have created phenomenal enterprise value and returns for its investors. Early 90s saw a lot of these shops. And then there was a next little wave during the dot-com time. And I think that if you think about these, these times, they were difficult, interesting times. And after the 2008, 2009, 
route in the quant world, I think we're seeing a lot of new interesting business models come out. There'll clearly be winners and losers depending on how you build your business. And we think we are on the frontier of that innovative, systematic efforts going on right now. One of the big aspects in moving to the next phase, I think, is to integrate a hybrid approach to, to take some of the good things that quantitative investing had and to drop the bad things, integrate it with some of the good things that simple, intuitive, fundamental investing has. And to create that hybrid process is really, I think, the ultimate nirvana for both the fundamental investors and the quant investors. So you'll see a lot of the world converge into this middle space of not trying to pick one or the other as a category because they're just tools and you want to create your best product using both tools. So I see the quant world moving more to either a high technology, high frequency, intraday trading world or to a more next generation world that is that is simpler in many ways in terms of technology and black boxiness and that incorporates some of the some of the hybrid fundamental insights. 